and you're live. Welcome back to the PASFAS Canada 2022 Virtual Prefab Symposium. Let's continue with our next session, the Prefab Advantage. Our speakers today are Kyle Moen and Mathieu Fry Tremblay from BC Passive House. If you would like to know more about our speakers, their information will be posted in the app later. If you have questions for our speakers, ask them in the Q&A chat below. I'll now hand it over to Mathieu to get us started. Thank you, Anna. So welcome everybody, thanks for being here. And today, the topic of our talk, the Prefab Advantage, will essentially explain in detail what's the process for building prefabricated buildings with the orientation towards passive house construction. And so yeah, I'll jump right in. So first step is an idea. You have a concept for a house or a building that you want to build, and then you have, you're considering prefabrication as your building method to make your, your dream come true. And in prefabrication, uh, you'll have two general options. Uh, you have panelization or flat pack prefabrication, and you'll, you will also have modular prefabrication. And both of those options have advantages and disadvantages. Um, I'll do a quick summary. So for example, panelization is what we specialize in at BC Passive House. So that's the examples you, you will hear, uh, you will see in the next couple of minutes are gonna be based on that system. Um, flat pack is a bit more flexible for options of design. You can build essentially any shape you would like with a panelized system. Um, it's also way more efficient for shipping uh, as you will, as you can essentially stack panels on top of each other on a trailer bed uh, with very little wasted space. And the other option, modular prefabrication, is a very well suited option for boxier designs and more repetitive designs where you will have the same shape repeating a, a lot a many times. Um, uh, it's also a very a good option for, it offers turnkey solutions. Uh, for example, when housing is needed very quickly, you're able to pre-finish those uh, modules or the boxes a bit more than with a, a panel system. Um, but the downsides to that is that shipping will be less efficient since you can usually mostly sh ship one or two modules per trailer, uh, which is which contains a lot of empty spaces and is therefore a bit less efficient for shipping. And on-site also lifting will be a bit more complex since you'll have pretty significant loads to lift with a crane. Uh, so that means larger cranes um, and a bit more pre preparation for lifting specifically. And now you can pick one or the other of the two systems and both of them will have other similar advantages. Uh, so for example, prefabrication in general increases a lot speed of construction uh, because the panels or the modules uh, shall dry and skid. The, pan the, sorry. the panels or the modules are prefabricated at the same time as your foundations can be built. Uh, so you basically do two steps at, one, at once instead of waiting for your foundations to be done before you start framing on site, for example. And, and in our experience, for example, for a typical relatively large house, setups can take around a week uh, for panelized systems. And for larger commercial buildings, commercial, let's say four-story buildings, um, like you'll see in the next couple, in the next couple of minutes, can take to maximum a month of setup. So that's significantly faster than if it was side framed. Um, prefab also helps mitigate the impact of bad weather uh, because setups can be targeted for drier times of the year, warmer times also. Um, especially in BC, for example, here, where snow is a pretty significant concern in the winter, or not concern, but challenge in the winter. Um, we can work around that a bit better with prefab. Um, and also the panels can arrive pre-membraned uh, or as or once they are set up in a week, let's say, membranes can be added very quickly to waterproof your building and, and keep the water out as much as possible. And prefab is also a great friend of remote sites uh, because it limits the, the need for skill, skilled labor and for materials to be shipped individually on, on a site that's less accessible by conventional trucks. And um, we have a very good example of that later. Um, and also, Prefab is also great to ensure uh, the best quality control you can have because the buildings will be modeled 
in 3D first, where everything can be reviewed by the architects, by the engineers, by the contractors. So there's no surprises in the end. There's no, well, it limits as much as possible unexpected costs because everything can be planned in advance by looking at the 3D model. And for quality control, it also helps that all the materials can be stored inside dry and can be uh, cut and assembled in the shop, again, dry, uh, which for wood helps helps eliminate any risk of warping or twisting uh, when wood soaks moisture if it's left in the rain for a while. Um, and also for a lot of prefabrication companies like us have CNC machines that can cut every, every single piece of wood um, basically to the quarter of millimeter precision. So that, that is also a very good help to ensure the best quality possible. And prefab also helps get the best air barrier and thermal control. Uh, because solutions for all envelope and air control and for all envelope air control and for all thermal bridges uh, can be considered again in the 3D model. Um, so there are no weak points when the building is set up. And um, is also prefab also helps again reduce cost controls because the process, as I said, reduces the unexpected expenses. Um, and it also allows trades, plumbers, electricians, Etc. to to plan their solutions ahead based on the 3D model, um, so they can have a good a good idea of their costs and reduce the overall cost for the overall unexpected costs for the clients. Um, and finally, prefab is a very good ally to reduce um, weight to reduce waste essentially, because the 3D softwares that are used to model the to model the buildings first usually have uh, optimized settings to to um, to use the least amount of materials as possible. So I'll give an example of this later. Um, but typically for, let's say for us at BCPH, we're able to reduce to between two and 2% 2 of material waste when we build a, a typical house compared to between 50 and 20% uh, on conventional side frame jobs. Um, and also there's no, you won't, you, re, you re greatly reduce the risk of wasting pieces, wasting a stud, wasting a plate. Because again, the machine cuts everything, so no mistakes. You won't accidentally cut a stud one inch too short and then need to discard it or use it for something else. And everything is cut perfectly by the CNC machine. So after those advantages, um, we're going to talk quickly about the steps in a prefabricated project. So the, the main actors in a project for us are usually the architect slash the client who drive everything the engineer responsible for structural, and then the contractor who does everything else. Um, different, different prefabrication companies will offer different services. Um, our examples and our, our process here will be based on what we do here at BCPH. So I will show a bit in, in later slides that we typically only do building envelope and structure. We're not responsible for windows. We don't do finishes. We don't do drywall, any of that. We just basically build and install the envelope, excluding windows and doors. Um, so here you can have a little overview of the steps. We'll go into each of them in detail in the next few slides. Initial contacts first, then deciding scope and signing contracts. Then we move on to 3D modeling, material optimization once the model is finished. Once the material is optimized and ordered, we move to fabrication and then shipping and installation. And everything after the installation will be handed to the contractor who will finish the house or the building. So first step, initial contact. This is where after you've had an idea of the project, clients and architects will basically form a plan. A first design will be made by the architect and then usually will be contacted by this architect uh, after the house, will, uh, the house or the building has been designed. Um, and then it's, this is a, a good step to start, um, to start discussing the assemblies, the construction methods. And, to, and we, we try to push as much as possible early on in those, in those uh, phases for the architects to modify their standard details to fit what we do here at BCPH. And that's a really good help uh, because if the architectural drawings reflect the prefabrication systems early on, it, re it reduces the risk, uh, not the risk, but then it reduces the need to go back and change things afterwards. Um, so starting on a good basis here is a very, a very um, practical thing for us. 
Um, so this is also at the point where all assemblies can be decided. So wall thicknesses, roof, roof thicknesses, floor uh, assemblies, etc. So after that, once you're ready to move ahead, we'll do scopes. We'll decide basically um, every, this precise scope of every single actor, contractor, prefab company will be decided. So as I said before, and as you can see on the picture on the left, our typical scope includes a building envelope and everything that is structurally needed. So once your house is installed by us or your building is installed by us, uh, you'll be left with a closed house, excluding doors and windows. The roof and the walls will be membraned, um, but everything else will be left to the contractor. So it's a good time to, do, to explicitly state what is whose job, essentially. Uh, as some and also some parts of, of houses typically don't make sense to be prefabricated, um, so that's a good opportunity to decide this here. Um, it's also a very good time to uh, to point out the interfaces between the trades, between what the contractor needs to do, what the the prefab company needs to do. So foundations that will be up to the contractor. If there's anything that needs to be wet set in the foundations, like hold downs. Uh, those need to be done by the contractor, but are still based on what they, they're still will, they will transition to what we install uh, right after. So that transition needs to be decide, needs to be clear and obvious. And um, same as roof membrane, uh, we'll typically add a, mem uh, a waterproof membrane, but that isn't uh, sturdy enough to be considered the, the long-term membrane of the roof. So that's something the contractor needs to do after. And so again, that's just a time to basically to state explicitly who will do what. And then once everybody agrees on those and on scheduling, um, the project can officially start on the prefab level. And so the, the first step of prefabrication after, after the contracts have been, have been signed for us will be to model the house. So the first step in 3D modeling for us is just roughing, it's just installing rough volumes of the building um, and the, object the objective here is simply to fix the geometry of the building. Uh, so every opening, every wall location, every floor elevation, roof overhangs, structural members, everything is, is drawn here, but in a rough uh, volume, no detail. Um, it's just basically a, a communi communication tool to then be able to issue what we call a geometry approval which is a set of 2D drawings based on the, 3D the rough 3D volumes that we did in a previous step. And so this is essentially, a, um, this is a communication tool for us. And at this point, the objective is to get the architect and the clients to commit to that geometry, because afterwards we're, we're gonna start building the model more in detail, and we really don't want to have to move backwards after this step. Uh, so window, rough geometries, elevations, everything is, decided and is fixed in this step. So we'll have, as you see here, a few little sections, a couple of details, um, listing every opening, every dimension, everything that's important to the building's geometry. And we'll also list uh, all the assembly compositions. So every wall will say, this is how we plan on building it with plywood, insulation, OSB, the stud thickness, the stud spacing, based on what the structural drawings uh, call out for. Um, and so once this, once this uh, set of drawings is issued by us, architects or clients will review it, sign it, and then this, makes the, the, this creates the foundation for everything that will be done in the, next follow, in the following steps. And so once the three, the, basically the, volu the volumes of the house have been fixed, we will we'll move on to framing the house, framing, framing it virtually in our 3D, model, in our 3D software. Uh, we use CAD work here at BCPH. It's a very it's a very good uh, CAD CAM software that allows us to model every single stud, every single clip. We can put screws if we wish to. Uh, it's essentially, everything that's going to be that's going to be built by us in the shop is modeled here. And the it's also the time where we start panelizing the house because we follow we follow the structural drawings to, spe to specify where studs need to needs to be, how joists need to be spaced. But then we need to break that structure down into sh into panels that we're able to ship. So typically for us, this is an eight foot wide by anything up to fifty foot long panel uh, is our 
is our most common size. We can get uh, oversized limits, oversized uh, loading limits for trailers, but typically an eight foot wide panel is our target. Uh, so this is the step where we do it. Um, it's, a, it's also a challenge for us to balance uh, efficiency in fabrication and also the transport limits. Uh, since the larger panels you can build, you can build will be more efficient in the shops. Uh, since building one very large panel is, takes about the same time as building two small ones, you just consider that it's the same joist that's twice as long. Um, so this is kind of it's kind of a puzzle for us. It's a fun step to do, um, and also having larger panels limits limits uh, the number of shop drawings, uh, individual shop drawings we need to to do afterwards for every single panel. So that's easy. And then once we're happy with the model, the 3D model, once we've framed essentially the whole house and added every structure, every clip, everything, then this model becomes really the, the master reference for what the house is going to be built with. Um, so no matter what's on the architectural plans, on the structural plans, the model, the model dictates what the house is going to be built with. So it's a good, it's an important thing to make sure that the architect and the engineers We'll review this model to be sure they are satisfied with everything that's in there. Um, and that's a very meticulous, that's a meticulous process for them. But we're able to share the 3D model with them. So they're able to go through and walk around the house, essentially look at every connection, everything, every opening, every, all the geometry. Um, and so they'll be able to basically sign off on the model. Um, so yeah, I went a bit ahead of myself, but after 3D modeling, then the step is to Confirm with the engineer that everything is up to their uh, their desires. So they they can they can isolate individual panels like I like I have shown here. And they can check out the structural members. They can make sure the headers are in the right places. They can make sure there's the right amount of stud. The spacings are right. And essentially, it's essentially a time for them to review everything. And it's if there's any modification that needs to be done at this stage, it's still easy uh, because we can go back in the model. Add a couple, add some some hardware a bit if it's needed, or modify some spacing. Um, and so once the once the engineer is happy with the mo the model as is, um, we're going to issue what we call well our shop drawings essentially. Uh, so every single panel will be drawn on the on the two D shop drawings plans shop drawing plans. Um, and this is also a step where our software CAD work is very 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 useful because. Exporting a drawing like you can like you can see here take about takes about a minute. Um, it, 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 there is a lot of work that goes behind the scenes, so there's a lot of building that needs to be done uh, in the structure of how the, the drawings are exported. But those are pretty efficient uh, for us to export. Um, so this is the last the last chance for the engineer basically to review everything, and this they have the opportunity to stamp those drawings um, because. This is this is going to be essentially the as-built version of structural plans. Um, so if there's any little detail that needs to be changed, can be done here. Um, even though it's not ideal because we did we did do some work in the background to issue those drawings. Um, so this again, this is the master plan, the master reference for how the house is going to be built. Um, and a thing that's convenient with CAD work and how we can export those uh, shell drawings. Is that every single stud, every single piece of hardware, every single screw, even if we want to specify structural screws, is numbered on in a list in the drawing, and every single piece is also exported to the CNC machine. I'll talk about this in a couple of seconds. So this is a very, this is a you could say a, an IKEA level plan, but a couple couple levels ahead. So once we issued our shop drawings, where the everything that's in the house is fixed, we'll also issue a foundation layout for the contractor. Um, and this ensures that there's a good transition between the 3D model and the actual house that's going to be built. And because the 3D model is essentially perfect, um, it's perfectly square, it's perfectly straight. Um, and after all the panels are, are built, prefabrication doesn't really allow you to modify or to, sh to shorten a wall because the foundation is crooked or something like that. Um, so it is important that the foundation is built as, is built based on the 3D model. Again, it doesn't matter what's on the architectural drawings or the structural drawings. Those still dictate uh, 
general like structural drawings will still dictate rebar and reinforcement needs, but the geometry as after the, the architect has reviewed it is only based going to be based on this set of drawings that we issue here. Um, so, it, so it's important that the contractor removes any other any other foundation plan from the construction sites once they receive our foundation layout, layouts because you can have a subcontractor a trades that looks at an, at an older um, superseded set of structural drawings that have a wall maybe one inch too high one inch too low um, and that can create some some pretty big headaches with prefabrication so um, yeah this again is, a, is another master reference foundations are to be built according to this geometry and only this one um, and yeah here we're going to essentially locate anything that needs to be wet set in the concrete so every hole down is will be identified precisely locations of piers elevations everything that will be on those drawings and we'll have a pretty extensive set of details to be sure that the information we want to communicate um, is communicated efficiently and accurately um, so after our foundation layouts are um, shared with the contractor we're, we go back to the 3D model and then we go to material optimization. So this is really where CAD work as a software shines the most. Um, so for example, for this house, we have a ton of studs. We have a few PSL beams. Um, we can usually order those in stock dimensions. So studs will go from 10 to 12 to 14 to 16 to 18 feet long. PSL, we can get it in different lengths, but optimal will be stock 48 feet long or 60 feet long pieces. So we're able to optimize the material we have in the model through CAD work and to basically tell us how many 14 foot studs we need to build a house, how many 16 foot studs we need. And that usually, that is also based with, it's also, um, it also considers how the studs are going to be cut on the CNC machine. So the sock curve of the cut is, re is considered when ordering, let's say a stock 60 foot long PSL that you need to fit a few different pieces in that the soccer for the hundred gear of the CNC machine will be considered and that's that's where it really shines and again how, as I said earlier we get between two and five percent of wasted offcuts from our material after our optimization is done and so yeah that's that's a really good tool to save save on, on materials and be be a bit more eco-friendly with reducing our wastes um, since yeah, we know construction can be a bit wasteful sometimes, the 3D model and CAD work model and CAD work software are very, very help helpful for that. Um, so we're gonna optimize our material, we're gonna send our, our order to our suppliers. And, and then once we receive everything, uh, every single piece of wood that we use here in the shop is gonna be cut on the CNC machine. We have a, a Hundiger KI2, K2I. Um, that we, I'm sorry, can't remember which one it is. Um, and this machine essentially talks directly to CAD work. So we can export every piece of wood that is modeled directly to the machine and it will cut. We can make some pretty, pretty fancy cuts. Uh, it doesn't just rip and cut the length. It can do grooves, it can do uh, dovetails. It's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty versatile machine. And so it ensures that, as I said earlier, we don't waste any, any part by making mistakes on cutting by hand. The machine is essentially perfect every time. Um, we can also control which tools the machine use to do which cuts to make sure we optimize the results for what we need. So sometimes if we're cutting studs, then the, the objective is to be fast and efficient. So we'll use the big saws and the routers as much as possible. And then if we cut some more delicate and more visually important pieces like, like uh, exposed glue and beams, then we can modify the process and choose the tools that are going to that are going to keep the pieces the, the nicest possible. Uh, no splinters, no no blowouts, no anything like that. Um, and then every we do get some offcuts. It's it's impossible to use every single to use 100% of the the pieces we use. Um, but the cool thing that we have in the shop here with the offcuts is that we 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 burn them in the winter uh, to heat the shop. So we don't we basically kind of create our own, own little circular economy by using our own waste to heat, to heat our shop. And, and so yeah, essentially that is, that is why the, the CNC machine is, is a fantastic tool. We, we love it very much. It's 
it's also pretty fast. So if anyone wants to rival, if any skilled carpenter wants to try and rival the, the efficiency of a CNC machine, I think that person will have a pretty safe job for, for the future. And so then once all the pieces are cut in their CNC machine, we move on to actual fabrication, uh, which is the step that the step that goes through most people's mind, most people's minds uh, when they think about prefabrication, it's just building something in the shop. But there's a lot of there's a lot that goes in the background that needs to happen before you can actually build panels in the shop. But now we're there, and um, we have, as most prefabrication companies have, we are able to control the climate indoors. We leave doors open in the winter, uh, in the sorry, in the summer when it's hot. We close them in the winter when it's cold, so material stays at stays dry and stays. A comfortable temperature, same for, for the workers. Um, and then essentially here it's a, it's a production line. You'll go from a framing table where every single piece is going to be nailed and assembled. Uh, then you're going to go to sheathing if it's interior walls or roof panels or anything. We mix and match the sheathings to, to fit the needs we need. Um, then we can flip the panels, we can insulate uh, in the shop. Uh, side note here, we use a cellulose blown insulation for as much, as much as possible where we can. Um, it's a very eco-friendly, it's essentially, it's essentially recycled paper and organic fibers. And so that's another eco-friendly alternative, alternative that we're able to use because we do closed panels. Uh, so the blown, the blown insulation doesn't just blow off when we move the panels, it gets enclosed inside. And it's also dry because it's inside. So, because it's indoors, it's assembled indoors. Uh, so you essentially eliminate the risk for moisture trapped inside your walls. Um, and then, yeah, essentially fabrication. That's the fun part. The, that's where you see your ho the house being built uh, in pieces in the shop. And then once those pieces are built, we move on to shipping. Uh, so as I said earlier, with, with flat pack panelization, uh, you're able to be very efficient with how you ship your panels. Uh, you can, as you can see in the picture, they stack very nicely on trailers. Um, so uh, what we do for shipping uh, is that we'll basically we'll essentially plan the shipping in 3D uh, beforehand. It's a, it's a it's a fun game of Tetris essentially where we try to find the most optimal panel layout to one uh, optimize the space and limit the cost due to shipping but also to be efficient when the, when the house is going to be built. So we'll usually uh, plan our, our assembly sequence, so the sequence in which the panels need to be installed on site, and then we'll load according to that. So the first panel that you need to, to, the first panel that you need to lift and drop will be the first panel that's on top of the trailer, and then the last one that you need will be the one at the bottom. Uh, so yeah, the loading is based on the installation sequence. Um, so that, again, improves the efficiency of, of the install. Um, and the trailers so are sorry, tired Matthew. in the show. Oh, sorry. So, so sorry, Matthew. I just want to let you know we have just about a minute left until we have to wrap. So I wanted to give you the opportunity to quickly wrap up. Yeah, we're almost there. Thank you. Um, so yeah, the trailers will be tarped in the shop. Uh, that's going to protect anything, everything from moisture and rain. Uh, so that ensures, again, quality control good quality uh, of the product we install. Um, and then, yeah, we're, shipping is also based on the legal loads that depending on where, you, where you're going to go, if you need to put it on a ferry or put it on a barge or something, or go over uh, low bridges, we can plan for that. Um, and then finally, the last step for us is installation. I'll go very quickly on this. We essentially install all the panels. The joints are taped, so we make sure we maintain a good air barrier. Uh, membranes are applied to get everything dry. And yeah, typical house for us takes about a week. And then finishing, um, that's up to the contractor essentially to make everything looking good and to bring the house from what, they, what is essentially an envelope and a structure uh, to yeah, a finished house that you'll be able to enjoy for a while. And yeah, I had a couple more slides, but I guess that's we're probably there for time. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthew. I do apologize yeah. uh, for having to cut you off just in the interest of, of uh, time and staying on schedule. Uh, yeah, so we didn't get. Yeah, yeah, thank you. We'll make sure that your presentation is is posted. 
Um, thank you to everyone who posted questions in the chat. We didn't get around to asking them uh, live uh, today, but we will make sure that um, all your questions are answered uh, after the session. So thank you again for everyone uh, who joined, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our future sessions. Uh, thank you again, Mathieu. Thank you very much.